Professor Julian Sira, member of the Nobel Committee. Could you please describe to us why our cells need to use autophagy or self-eating? So autophagy, you know, comes from the Greek terminology of self-eating. And without autophagy, our cells won't survive. We need autophagy to ward off um, in invading molecules, for example, to deal with very large proteins that might be long-lived or perhaps defective. So we need to be able to have autophagy to degrade proteins, but we also need autophagy for renewal. In other words, we need autophagy to break down proteins for um, self-reliance. What was the state of knowledge uh, before the work of the CS laureate? So, um, Yoshinori Osumi started his work on this problem in the 1990s. And before that time, people understood that the cell had a lysosome, or in his case, a, a vacuole in, in the yeast. People thought that the vacuole was like a, a waste dump. People didn't know much about molecules like the, the um, autophagy process, but they could see that morphologically it existed in the cells. So the machinery was unknown, and how the system was working was unknown, and whether or not it was involved in disease was also unknown. Sounds like a biological enigma. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think that Dr. Oshumi was interested in working on problems that other investigators stayed away from. If you turn to the, the discoveries, um, the, the key findings, what was the first step here? Dr. Osumi worked with yeast cells, and they're a relatively simple cell. It's a singular cell. It's an organism with one cell. And he was interested in understanding things under the microscope. So the first problem he wanted to tackle was whether or not these yeast cells had autophagy. So he created a really ingenious way of studying them. He developed cells that didn't degrade proteins in the lysosome. And he reasoned that if he could stop the degradation process, he could see an accumulation of, um, of the autophagy machinery in these cells. So he looked at yeast cells under the microscope and he subjected them to starvation. That induces autophagy. And he could see an accumulation of phagosomes in the cell. So he could look at this under the microscope and these, um, uh, they were, these, this machinery was moving under the microscope. He could see them visually. So that was the first step. Then when he had a system where he could see an accumulation of autophagosomes in the cell, he could then study these yeasts by inducing a chemical that led to mutations. And he reasoned that if he could mutate the genes that were important for autophagy, he may be able to then identify genes that regulated this process. So he could screen these yeast cells that were chemically uh, modified, and he identified 15 genes that were important for the autophagic process for autophagy. He then went on, in the third step, to um, clone the, the gene products, and he could study the proteins that were a part of this autophagic machinery. He could study that this process was um, responsive to stress, starvation, and that it involved a cascade of proteins that came together in complexes. And he could study these protein complexes and how the autophagosome was formed and how that was fused with the lysosome and how the contents of the autophagosome were degraded in the cells. It seems to me this is a very complex system. Um, in order to describe this price in an accessible way, is there a metaphor one could use? So I think you could think of early on the lysosome or the vacuole was seen as sort of a waste dump. And before Osumi came on the scene, people understood that that waste dump was in the cell. But what he showed was that it wasn't a waste dump, it was a recycling plant. This was a really sophisticated machinery that recycled damaged or long-lived proteins, and they were kind of reused. So if you think of this example, every day we need to replace about two to 300 grams of protein in our body. Every two to three months, every protein in our body turns over. Because of autophagy, these two to 300 grams of protein 
um, are, are made. We're eating proteins every day, about 70 grams of protein, but that's not enough to take care of the requirement to make new proteins. Because of this machinery, we're able to rely on some of our own proteins, maybe the damaged proteins or the long-lived proteins, and they're recycled with this sophisticated machinery so that we can sustain and we, don't, and we survive. Also, this uh, price is for physiology or medicine, so then what would be the medical implications of this? Right, so you're right that this award mm. is for fundamental physiology. Uh, yeah. That's right. But it really has a very strong implication for different diseases. So, for example, we can think of with starvation. We need this process to survive starvation because we can have a self-renewal of our own protein so we can survive. That's one thing. We also need this process for embryogenesis. We need this process for cell division. We need this process to be functioning for normal physiology. There's examples of where this process is important to ward off diseases. For example, if you have a bacteria or a virus that infects a cell, we need this machinery to be able to ward off um, viral infections. The machinery is also important for diseases associated with aging. So, for example, if we have damaged or toxic proteins, they need to be handled. If they're not handled correctly, they can build up, and that can lead to diseases like neurogenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, maybe diabetes. If you have too much autophagy, that may be associated with cancer, and the tumor cells may survive. So, too much is not good, and too little is not good as well. So, if we turn to um, that our attention to the laureate, who is he? So, Yoshinori Usumi is still an active researcher today. He was um, born in 1945, so he's 71 years old. He just recently published a paper, and he's still working today on the cell biology and the structural biology of the um, autophagic machinery. So he's very, very active as a scientist, even yet today. He's a professor emeritus at the Tokyo Institute of Technology, of course, in Japan. And finally, has the Nobel Committee been able to, to reach Professor Rousseau? Just this morning, Professor Perlman, the secretary of the Nobel Assembly, had a telephone conversation. Um, he, he got him on the first number we had on our list. He was in his office, in his lab. And I think he was very delighted. I think that he was surprised. He wasn't expecting this. And he's looking forward to coming to visit us all in Stockholm. Thank you so much.